I entered the profession against my will and I said it is a parasitic profession and all that. But you know the legend of the profession is something which is fascinating. You know you hear of great trials, a great cross-examination, great lawyers. You know it's a dream, it's your dream to fight for liberty. Such a fascinating, very romantic subject. But then I never thought that uh, my boon will be granted with such plenty. Welcome to the KG Kannabiran Lectures on Law, Justice and Human Rights. It is now a decade since Kannabiran passed on. He was a man, take him all in all. I shall not look upon his like again. It was Hamlet. Kannabiran was a self-taught and self-made man in a profession where godfathers and family and class meant everything. He rose from humble beginnings to legendary heights through sheer dedication and hard work. A prolific reader, he devoured every piece of literature that came his way as he struggled through school, college and practice. It was precisely that reading which expanded his mind. What forged him into a legend was a sensitive and brilliant defense of political dissidents and revolutionaries who were hunted down by the state during the emergency. He converted the courtroom into a literary convention, often asking his clients to recite poetry or explain the philosophy for which they were charged to the judge. He prided himself on his radical interpretation of the law, often educating the judges before whom he appeared to interpret the spirit and intent of the constitution. He was admired and loved for his fearless defense of causes, coupled with a deep tenderness for his poorer clients, which made him a much loved figure in Andhra Pradesh. He inspired many young lawyers searching for some meaning and radical dimensions in the practice of law. As president of the Andhra Pradesh Civil Liberties Committee and the People's Union of Civil Liberties, he was critical to expanding these movements to powerful institutions of human rights defense. He was involved in human rights work across the country which was idolized and adored particularly in his home state, Andhra Pradesh, by the poor and disempowered and often resented by rich and powerful people unless they had a case or a cause they needed him to fight. It is now a decade since his death and given the state of human rights today, his presence is sorely missed. This is an effort to preserve his heritage for the bright young lawyers who are emerging today, a generation that he sincerely believed would restore decency, dignity and justice to our country. Thank you. The family of KG Kandabiran welcomes you to the KG Kandabiran lectures on law, justice and human rights. Ten years after his death, we remember his spirit, his resistance and his constitutional insurgencies in courts and through courts and tribunals, in defense of dissent, personal liberty, associational freedoms and justice, speaking truth to power, calling for judicial accountability and state accountability, especially in the matter of repressive laws, custodial violence and extrajudicial murders, encounter killings, calling out entrenched practices of discrimination and structural violence, and setting out the basic structures of constitutional rule. We bring together a few of the lawyers and judges who knew him personally and worked with him on cases, campaigns and tribunals to remember their collaborations with him and reflect on future pathways of this important slice of the history of lawyering for human rights and civil liberties rooted in the Indian experience. KG Kanabiran lived and worked in Andhra Pradesh in Hyderabad. He travelled across the country, appearing in courts of trial and high courts and in people's tribunals and fact-finding missions. 
from Kashmir, Assam and Manipur to Tamil Nadu, Chhattisgarh to Gujarat to Punjab, Karnataka and beyond. Within Andhra, every nook and corner, every forest and town bear his footprints. Practically every court in every jurisdiction in the state bears his imprint. Every university, meeting hall, meeting ground has heard him speak untiringly on the meanings of the rule of law and the constitution. No place was out of bounds in his quest for justice. We hope to remember him through the futures of his work and through the work of those who carry it forward in so many different ways. In this specific segment of lectures, we bring together the voices of those who shared his calling. Retired Justice Zach Yaku, blind from infancy, studied at a school for the blind, is married to Anu and has two adult children. He completed LLB at the University of Durban, Westville. While there, he joined the ANC underground. As an advocate from 1973 to 1998, he participated in anti-apartheid and community organizations, including the UDF, Detainees Parents Support Committee, and the DHAC, and disability organizations. He ran a significant and diverse commercial and general legal practice, defended political prisoners charged for defying unjust apartheid laws, challenging dis detentions without trial, house arrest, and other restrictive decrees. He was part of the DLA. Zach Yaku took silk in 1991. As judge of the Constitutional Court of South Africa from 1998 to 2013, he became known nationally and internationally for his contribution to the socio-economic rights jurisprudence of South Africa. He has attended national and international conferences and workshops largely on human and socio-economic rights, constitutionalism, disability, and blindness. Before appointment as judge of the Constitutional Court, Justice Zak Yaku participated in the negotiation process and played a role in finalizing the Bill of Rights in the 1993 Interim Constitution. He was part of the Independent Electoral Commission, responsible for South Africa's first democratic election in 1994, and part of the Independent Panel of Experts that advised the Constitutional Assembly in preparing the 1996 Final Constitution. He was Chancellor University of Durban Westville from 2001 to 2003. After retirement, he received the 2013 Felicia and Sidney Kentridge Award for service to the law in Southern Africa and honorary doctorates from the University of Fort Hare, KwaZulu Natal, Witwatersrand, Stellenbosch, and Pretoria. Justice Jakob is visiting professor at local and international law schools, was chair of the Sanat Trust served voluntarily on boards to various civil society organizations and as ombud at the University of Pozulu Natal. Justice Zach Yakub is currently interim chair of the Interim Board of Cricket South Africa. Hello everyone. This is truly a wonderful opportunity to talk about a man who, although he was quiet, was courageous, committed, and convincing. And that is why we have chosen to call this the quiet, courageous, committed, convincing Kanna. I met Mr. Kanna Biren, who I will call Kanna from now on, because he and I did become very good friends, for the first time in October 2001, and had contact with him, very intense contact with him, upon several occasions since 2001 to around 2007. During that time, we sat together in his work area through long afternoons and evenings, discussing many matters of importance and talking about a whole range of matters. I learned a great deal from uh, our conversations then. They were wonderful, they were enjoyable, they were challenging, as you will see, and they were different in the sense that Kanna's views 
did not really accord with the views of general society. Quite apart from the fact that I found his views challenging, I found his company good and I thought that he had a great deal to offer and I agreed with virtually everything he said. So now let's start. I want to first start with Kanna and capital punishment or the death penalty. He was completely against the death penalty, regarding it as murder. He was quite clear that people are treated unequally in trials, that the punishment of crime is quite often used for political purposes, that there are murders in government as everywhere else, that the imposition of the death penalty actually means that what you are doing is behaving absolutely inhumanely and working on the assumption that a human being is not humane. He made uh, a petition in relation to the removal of the death penalty, mm -hmm. um, in relation to the Rao's, who the people of India will remember and understand, <coughs> who were sentenced uh, to death some years ago. And his memorandum making these points to the president actually succeeded on the death penalty. And um, the death penalty was actually not imposed on them. But his views about crime and punishment too were different. At the one level, he thought that crime was quite often punished for political reasons. Of course, with that lay the mm -hmm. assumption mm -hmm. that the death penalty was often instituted for political reasons. But more deeply, we had many discussions about the best way to prevent crime in a particular country. And after long discussion, we agreed that society should move in a direction where the criminal law was not the only tool to ensure that people are uh, punished for crime or that punishment is not the only way to reduce um, crime. He was of the view that people commit crime whether others go to jail for it or not. And therefore, when someone is about to commit a crime, he used to ask me the question, says, do you think the man is thinking when he's committing a crime that he's going to be caught? The man is not thinking that he's going to be caught at all. So what is the answer, we say? And he says, well, the answer is that we have to change society. We have, change, we have to change the ideas in society. We've got to make sure that people in society respect each other and respect human beings. It's a hard job, but he didn't feel... Because I asked him, does that mean that all the criminals go, go free in the meantime? He said, no, no, no. We've got to have a fair system of trying people who do things. We've got to try and remove the political element from trials. At the same time, we have got to uh, ensure that the education of people continues. So... The idea of what we call now restorative justice was something which Kanna expressed a great deal. In fact, I wasn't able to discuss with him our legislation in our country, which has other methods of justice for young juveniles, where in relation to certain crimes which they commit, what we try to do is restore people to each other, get people to understand why someone did it, and try and call, uh, pull it out in some ways. So, uh, as Kanna would say, suppose someone steals a loaf of bread from somewhere. There's no point in sending him to jail. The real point is that what we should do is ensure that you get the victim, that is the shopkeeper or somebody whose bread was stolen from, and uh, the accused, that is the person who stole the loaf of bread, particularly if the accused is a very young person under, under the age of 14 years old, you get the child and the owner of the bread together, get them to talk to each other, get them to understand each other and see how we can fix it. So for young people, 
uh, a justice system has to be somewhat different. But he never ever said that there should be no criminal trial at all. And then we had a long discussion in, 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 in relation to sex work. Now, sex work, both in your country and in our country, is, is illegal, and India and South Africa are completely together on this. And he and I were completely together, coming from both these countries, that both India and South Africa were wrong in their approach. We talked about the, what happens when sex workers become criminalized. The first thing that happens and this happened in India and our country. Uh, Kana and I discussed this in some detail. That when they go to jail, charged with uh, doing sex work at one level or another, what happens then is that the police go into the cells and rape them. They tend to think that sex workers have no right to say no. They have no rights at all. And so many sex workers have been raped in police stations, both in India and South Africa. And I may say in many parts of the world that it's really, really difficult. So sex workers are raped, firstly. Secondly, they're not well looked after. It's very unlikely for them to have a fair trial because society is loaded against them. And then what do you do? Say the sex worker goes to jail for a year or two, then the sex worker comes out of jail, still hungry, still having no food, still having no job. In fact, the fact that she's been to jail means jobs and so on and so on are, 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 are more difficult for her to maintain. And therefore, we really came to the conclusion that prosecuting sex workers for what they did was actually the very, very wrong thing. And, and it shouldn't be done and it should, it should change as quickly as possible. And then we had long and interesting discussions on constitutional values, on dignity, equality, and freedom. And he used to always say that freedom is, can't be uncontrolled because if freedom is uncontrolled, then the powerful take complete advantage of the rich. And that was uh, really one of the things that concerned him a great deal. The other side of the coin, he said, about freedom is that when people are, are so-called free and they are very poor, it is impossible for them to exercise their freedom. So freedom is a value or a power which only well-off people can enjoy and which poor people cannot enjoy. And he says he would say that about all civil and political rights. We discussed the right to vote, for example, and we'll talk a little later about the nature of the democracy he believed in. But as far as the right to, the right to vote was concerned, he used to say two things to me. The first thing he was worried about is whenever there are elections, because our country, there's illiteracy and so on and so on, people get persuaded to vote in a particular way without enough knowledge. The second trouble of freedom, uh, the, the right to vote actually, was that when people are very poor, then a loaf of bread or 10 or 20 rupees could very, very easily buy a vote and you can't really um, stop that in any way. So that was the problem with that kind of political right. Again, did we need a prerequisite, some kind of prerequisite, some, some level of, of political awareness and some level of economic power before we could exercise our vote properly? And I agreed with him that, that that was so, and he felt very strongly about this. But all this was based on the fact that he was a man who felt amazingly sympathetic to the position 
of people who had no food, no water, no cleanliness, who earned very little. And that's why his objection was to the kind of society we have. His objection was to the society in which trade unions are not powerful, and that's so both in our country and, and, in, and in India. And he believed that uh, poor people get taken for a ride all the time. And let me say this, that it wasn't a theoretical thing for him, poverty. Many people talk about poverty as if it is a theoretical concept. Not so Utkana. Utkana, the poverty was something which meant a great deal to him. The poverty was, was something which made him feel very, very sad. So he thought that fair labor practice was very important in the country, that there should be strong trade unions and so on to make sure that things are done appropriately and properly. But um, more than that, he said to me that the most important rights are social and economic rights. A person basically must have housing, must have some kind of income to live a, a reasonably decent living, must have a measure of social security, because without those things, a human being is only, only half complete. And he used to rely quite a lot on the Supreme Court of India, relying on the right to life to ensure that constitutional, all kinds of social and economic values and rights were made available to everybody. Uh, and uh, many of you will recall that the judges of the Supreme Court made it quite clear that life is not just a question of living. It means that you must have a certain essential to make sure that life is not uh, a life which is worth nothing. A life should be worth something, should make possible our development, should make possible our education and so on. So he would also rely on the right to life very strongly and say that that right to life is actually something which can only be properly sorted if people were less poor. And he didn't believe that people were entitled to what they earned and stop right there. He was very, very clear that the idea, and he used to tell me, you know, many of these people, they believe that people are lazy because they're poor. And he taught me that that is nonsense. So the other way around, I'm sorry, that people were poor because they were lazy. He said to think that if you work hard, you can always make it. He said to me, people don't know what they're talking about. Because if you don't have a job, then it is very, very difficult to, to make a living. So the government and its duty to ensure that housing was properly provided, that a certain minimum uh, was properly provided to ensure that employers properly paid workers and so on. But he was aware that these are all very, very long-term things. Now I return to his views about justice and the courts. His view about justice and the courts were that the appointment of judges is a very important thing. He was very impressed by the South African view where we have a Judicial Services Commission, which has societal represent representatives, judicial representatives, as well as community representatives and political people, a body of 25 people who conducted private, inter public interviews rather, before the appointment of judges. He thought that that might be an idea which would work because otherwise, judges get appointed, they get appointed for all kinds of other reasons. Judges get appointed because they become part of, he used to call it an old boys club, uh, when judges appoint judges. And, 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 and but his main problem with judges is that many of them 
were not independent enough to stand up against government. And he believed that judges should be independent enough to stand up against government. And they used to tell me that judge is not merely an empire. No? Not empire, he can't just sit there like he's watching a cricket game when he's conducting, conducting a court case. And I'll come to, I'll come to cricket uh, just now. Um, he says that judges must intervene and make sure the playing fields are level. You've got to make sure that both sides have an equal opportunity. So he said if one side is weak and the other side is strong, the judge must support the weaker side and make sure that the weaker side gets a measure of support and so on. And he thought too that cricket, he enjoyed playing cricket. He enjoyed watching cricket. But for him too, the idea of cricket was, um, was something which was socially relevant. He enjoyed the game, but he didn't just play it and forget about it and relax. He thought very deeply about cricket. He thought very deeply about its money-making potential. And he used to say that, you know, in anything, if there's too much money, things go wrong. He repeated that again and again. So although he, he was a wonderful cricketer, uh, he, he, he had a wonderful sportsman-like approach to things, but he was again concerned. He would not, he would not look at sport separately. For him, society was one important area with all aspects related to each other, which must actually be taken together. So even cricket was, was part of society. But to return to justice, justice was an important concept, but he, he bemoaned the fact that constitutional values are not properly understood, that some judges understand them and others don't. And there is a problem that you can predict what judgments people are going to give. And he thought that was, that was not a good thing. And uh, he was really of the view that the judiciary needed to change drastically, not only in India and the world, for us to have justice. In fact, it pained him to see the amount of injustice in our country he, and in India. He didn't like it. And uh, he wasn't very hopeful that constitutional principles would, be, would begin to be obeyed by everybody. He was thinking, no, it will take a long time. But, you know, we'll talk about it for a long time. But before we do it, it will take an even longer time. And that was his problem. And then we talked about the nature of the state quite a bit and democracy and freedom of religion. He was very moved by the fact that majorities generally favor themselves and don't, don't take into account other values or don't control themselves. And in that sense, he seemed quite happy that both our constitution, the constitution of India, and the constitution of South Africa had constitutional values in relation to uh, our democracy. But he was very disappointed with the one person, one vote scenario. Um, and in the Indian context, the one person, one vote scenario and its complications were tied to his very deep views on whether a country is a secular state or a state belonging to some religion. And you will recall that when I knew him 13 years ago, the idea of, of disregarding minority religions was still, uh, was already quite dominant in India. And one never thought it could get worse. Now, religious intolerance has got even worse. And Hindu-based parties are saying, we have got a Hindu country and we are going to run it. I must say that Kanda foresaw all of this in our discussion. I honestly didn't think that it could get much worse than it already was. 
but he foresaw it and it does get much worse. And then for him, he says, well, democracy and uh, one person, one vote by itself is a problem. It's really a problem because, take India for, an exam uh, for example, the constitution says everybody has a vote, so people will vote, and when they vote, they will vote for people of their religion. Say so the vast majority of people belong to a particular religion, they will vote for them, and quite necessarily the things will go in the sense of being supportive of the majority without values. I have some um, sympathy with that position because I would suggest that the most important area of a democracy is a value system which all of us have got to embrace. And unless the whole of our society embrace the value systems of equality and freedom and justice and social justice, the mechanical one man, one vote, or one person, one vote uh, procedure just doesn't begin to work. And he would have agreed completely. But I must repeat that he used to say to me, this is going to get worse in India. And I didn't see how it could get worse in India. And he was absolutely right. And then as far as democracy is concerned, then, if one man, one vote doesn't work, what does work? And he believed that we've got to have a system in which people accepted as part of their making themselves available certain values which had nothing to do with religion. Those values have to be put out there for comment. And he had a very interesting thought. He thought it might be a good idea if those values were put out in the names not of known individuals, but in the names of people who we didn't know. So we didn't complicate it with, uh, with anything, with names and religious grouping and so on. And then what we should do he, that was quite an interesting idea, he, he thought, and it might even work, that what we should do is send out those ideas, those values to people, and ask people what set of values they want to vote for. And then you make sure that uh, a, a party or some kind of structure is formed to... Uh, make sure that everybody then sticks to those values once we have the country. And he said, for this to be done, it mustn't be done only when you make a constitution. Every time there's an election, people must not vote for religious groupings. They must not vote for particular individuals. They must vote for particular, particular value systems. Finally, I want to talk about Kanna the lawyer and Kanna the human being. He was a sensitive lawyer. He believed that uh, people who are minorities need the help of law more and more. He helped young people in the law. He did a lot of work for which he charged no money. And therefore one would know that his lifestyle, if all of you knew it, was much more modest than the lifestyle of a lawyer of his class and his style would be expected to be in India. I have been to the home of many a successful lawyer and I must say that his house was the most modest of them all that I have seen and it was really wonderful. It was homely, friendly and good to be there. He was almost a recluse. He made a few comments from time to time, but he was quiet generally. He had a sense of humor. The odd joke would escape him. But let me end by saying that he was wonderful to his family. The grandchildren who were young when I uh, met him really loved him and they were close. You should see his humanity creeping out. 
So there he was, a good human being, a human being who made a contribution to the world and who had ideas from which all of us can still learn. And I end by saying, I really hope that all of us will take his ideas and his notions seriously and try and build a society in India around them. And I hope that we in South Africa too can try and build our society. We too have a majoritarian problem, even though religion is not the problem here. And the majoritarian problem is that there's too much reliance on people giving out food parcels and t-shirts and, and something to drink and eat and so on to get support. And that is a huge problem, which I think that Kanna would not have liked. So thank you very much. There you have it. Uh, a man who had all the good characteristics that, that I can think of and a man whose bad characteristics I really can't think of at the moment. I suppose that's because I didn't live with him for a long time. Thank you very much indeed.